Uh, today we are going to talk about some of the late components, namely F-wave, A-waves and H-reflexes. Uh, These are important parts of the uh, neurography investigation. Let's start with F-waves. Usually they look like this. We uh, stimulate the nerve distally and record the C-map first and then with a higher gain we see late components. If the gain is for example 10 millivolt per division here it is 0.5 millivolt per division here since these are very small signals. We repeat this uh, in our laboratory 20 times, in other laboratories 16 or 10 times but it should be many times to let the individual axons give a chance to elicit an F wave. The uh, physiology behind this is that the axon is activating in antidromic directions after distal stimulation and it invades the motor neuron that then becomes depolarized and it stays uh, depolarized for a short while when the uh, axon now is uh, starting to become uh, repolarized and ready for a new impulse and sometimes in less than 5% of the occasions the motor neuron can still give rise to a new impulse in the first inter uh, node and the impulse starts in distal direction. How do we measure F wave latencies? Well first one simple technique is to measure the shortest out of 20 recordings for example and in our laboratory we also subtract the distal latency so that for example a carpal tunnel uh, does not have an abnormal F response. That is the, the minimum uh, latency. Another technique that has been used is called chronodispersion and that is the range of minimum latencies. Here's the shortest minimum latency, here's the longest minimum latency and the difference between the two is called chrono dispersion. The other parameter that we measure in F-Wave is number of uh, responses uh, for example per 20 recordings that is called persistence. Minimum latency for the different nerves here, this is median, ulnar, fibular and tibial nerve are not very much dependent on age. It is like a nerve conduction study when we talk about older people. A slight tendency maybe, but when it comes to uh, dependency on height it is very pronounced naturally because uh, we record only uh, latency, we do not recalculate that into some kind of pseudo velocity. So here is uh, the different graphs for the dependence on height and in the real life we combine the two with an algorithm so the median nerve F latency is equal to a constant plus 0.03 times age plus 0.06 17 times height and a standard deviation of so and so. And here you can see that the height dependency is not so strong and here in the leg nerves it's much uh, stronger. The number of F waves per 20 stimuli varies very much between nerves because of different excitability of the spinal cord. Here is typical from the median nerve from uh, uh, 152 uh, subjects and often in the median nerve we have more than 10 out of 20 but it's difficult to make an exact number here. The ulnar nerve is much more prone to give uh, responses so that is usually uh, above uh, 15. The fibular nerve does not have so many F responses, even one or two is normal. And the tibial nerve gives usually more than 18 traces with F responses out of 20. Uh, 
that is because we have uh, responses from each of the small intrinsic foot muscles. We do the study with the patient at rest. We do not activate at all. It, uh, to have uh, the situation at rest is the most standardized. But we have an one exception here, and that is when we study patients in the intensive care unit, and they have been paralyzed for a long time, and uh, have long inactivity in their limbs, then the F responses may disappear. But we can wake them up by making a short high frequency stimulation, and now immediately after that, the F responses come back. This can be a very important trick to make so that we don't misinterpret the uh, absence of F responses as some kind of neuropathy. Instead, it's a motor neuron excitability that has been changed. Here's a very schematic uh, interpretation of uh, F waves. These are the C map, and here are F waves, which, as you know, is a, a sum of a few axons that give rise to to a motor unit potential surface recorded. So here's the variability since we have different axons that are active and the shortest is here. C map amplitude is normal, F amplitude is normal. That is a measure that we usually don't uh, calculate and the number of F responses is normal. When we have a demyelination, all the F responses are delayed. So CMAP amplitude and F amplitude are normal, and persistence is normal, but the latency is increased. When it comes to conduction block, then uh, the CMAP, depending on the position of the block, is normal, but we have fewer uh, F responses. So the C map is normal, F amplitude of those that occur is normal, but we have few, a reduced persistence. If we go back to normal now, and then we look at next type of pathology, namely axonal loss, for example in, in, in nerve trauma entrapment or so, we have reduced uh, C map amplitude, and we have fewer F responses because we have fewer axons where F responses can be transported. The amplitude here, at least in the beginning before re innovation the amplitude is normal. So CMAP 50%, uh, F amplitude normal and number of F is 50% of normal. Now, if we had been able to follow this patient over uh, three months, we should have seen that we have re -innovation. That means that the C map has become larger, and those axons that conduct, that still survive, they produce re -innovation. and we see complex large uh, F responses, but they are very uh, few still. So C map is normal, F amplitude is increased, and that we usually assess visually, and the persistence is low. That is the chronic neurogenic situation. If we have a myopathy, the C map amplitude is normal or lowish, and the uh, F responses should be low compared to uh, normal material, but this is always very difficult to measure. But at least it's important to see that the persistence is normal. So C map is low, F amplitude may be low, and persistence is normal uh, because all the axons and neurons are there. If we have spasticity, then it's larger likelihood that we produce uh, F responses in each of the axons. So therefore we have a summation of F responses to give this F wave uh, in many of the traces. So the C map amplitude is normal, the F amplitude is increased, and the persistence is really increased. It fills up uh, every, every trace, and there is an increased dispersion as well. Well, these were some uh, simple schematic drawings and this can be good to think in these lines when we make the interpretation of F responses.
here we have the um, a practical usefulness of F waves. Since we are studying two meters of nerve instead of only half a meter in the forearm on the leg, uh, it is easier to to detect uh, real slight changes in the conduction. And many publications have shown that the F wave latency is the first and the most sensitive parameter to detect a slight slowing. Here is uh, the upper normal limit for the uh, patient's age and height. And here you see that all responses come outside the limit. And here is the shortest out of the uh, 20. If we have conduction block in the glen anywhere along the nerve, above or below the stimulation, we do not produce any F responses. So that is uh, empty. Here's another uh, a technical uh, situation where we have the charcoal my tooth type 1 and first of all you see a lot of late components here, very pronounced. The velocity is 26 meter per second so that is half of the normal. And then when we look at F responses with the ordinary sweep speed we see something here but it comes way too early. Uh, th this is not F waves. This is uh, something else that belongs to the C map. And now, when we change the sweep speed, we see the latency that is uh, very much prolonged. It's 64 milliseconds. And with the conduction velocity, we expect exactly that uh, latency. So remember, with slow velocity, change the sweep speed on the instrument. We have uh, usually looked at the uh, increase in latency and reduction in number, but we have also the other way around that we may have too many F responses, and that is in spasticity, where many axons give rise to an F response. Here is the normal side in a patient uh, spastic on the left side, and here you see that many F responses have summated to give this high amplitude and uh, uh, signals and uh, fill up every uh, trace. Here's another patient. Uh, left median and left ulnar is normal. And right median you see more than on the left and on the ulnar more than on the left. These were very slight clinical signs of increased re reflexes in this side. One thing that we should think of is uh, when we uh, judge the persistence. If the amplitude is low because of loss of neurons, then we are expected to find fewer uh, F responses. And here we have the amplitude of the C map in number of standard deviations from normal. Lower normal is uh, two standard deviations. And if we have good amplitudes here, then we have normal persistence. But when the amplitude goes down and is abnormally low, then we also have correspondingly uh, lower uh, F persistence. So it's a line going uh, through the graph like this. And now we shall look at some of the uh, classical motor nerve parameters for different uh, conditions, but we shall concentrate just on the uh, F waves. So in demyelination we have increased in guillain barre and critical illness polyneuropathy. When it comes to persistence, it's re reduced in exonal damage in neuropraxia, guillain barre ALS, all these because they also have low C maps and in severe uh, uh, CTS uh, when we have low uh, motor amplitudes. Now we shall talk a few minutes about the special phenomenon when the motor neuron is giving uh, more than one F wave per 20 stimuli and we call that uh, repeater F wave. So that is really F waves and they repeat two to seven times. If it is more by definition, we then call it 
uh, A waves. Here is uh, an example. This uh, F wave and this one and this are identical. But here in the other traces you see this is an other, this is other F waves, these are other F waves. So among the different A, uh, F waves we have one that is repeating with constant shape and latency. When we superimpose we see that better. Here is another way to visualize uh, repeaters. For example, if you see number two here, this and this and this is the same. And if you look at number four, this and this and this is the same. So this patient had many uh, repeater F waves. And when we superimpose, we see that this is just one superimposed. Uh, it looks like, like one signal here. Uh, and the others uh, do not show a, a constant latency. Here we have three, and you see these three are superimposed with a darker uh, line. <coughs> the frequency of repeaters is very low in uh, healthy. We can have um, a few in some of the nerves in each uh, uh, patient. That is not uh, definitely abnormal. But when it comes to demyelinating polyneuropathy, ALS, carpal tunnel and so on, then we have an increased chance of uh, seeing a uh, repeater F waves. And that is true for all nerves. This is median nerve. This is for ulnar nerve with another entrapment. Fibular nerve for another entrapment. And uh, the mechanisms is not fully understood. Is it just a statistical chance that we give many stimuli and and therefore it's a chance to see a few uh, identical discharges from sun axons or is it really um, a sign of pathology? Here is um, an attempt to discuss the latter. If we have an hyperexcitability with uh, increased central influence or less inhibition uh, it may be that uh, we produce extra F waves. If we have a problem with the Renshaw inhibition that uh, is uh, regulating the firing rate of the neuron, which we have in, in certain intoxications, and, and we can also have that in, in certain neuropathies, we may have extra discharges. Another thing is that if we have a loss of axons, we have a retrograde change in the anatomy and physiology of the motor neuron and we get the phase of hyper excitability that theoretically should be able to uh, cause the uh, repeat ref wave. I draw the conclusion on basis of the fact that so many of patients with uh, repeat ref wave have some kind of axonal uh, loss. And finally we also have the situation when we have lost other neurons and our main neuron is still intact if we have lost a lot of neighbors they in many cases pro, uh, provide inhibition to this neuron so if we lose inhibition because of loss of neighboring neurons then this one can become uh, influenced and give uh, extra F responses. Now we go over to something completely different, namely A waves that we see now and then, particularly in tibial nerve, it's nearly normal to see it. We see that in 10 or 20 percent and in the other nerves much less common. Uh, here is an example and the typical thing is that there are uh, low amplitude like F waves, low amplitude signals, but these are with constant latency, completely constant latency, and they can occur right after the CMAP, right within the F response is not seen here, or even after the F response. We see them better when we superimpose traces, and the mechanism can be some of the following. Initially this was thought to be an 
axon reflex like we have on sensory side. We stimulate here, activate the muscle and in anterograde direction also activate the muscle via an extra branch. This is not very common to happen at all. Another uh, possibility is that we have a local hyperexcitable abnormal area in the nerve ionic uh, changes usually and when we stimulate down here then the signal goes in uh, the orthodromic direction but also antidromic and starts an extra uh, pulse like an uh, electrical tinnel and the pulse then uh, travels down to the muscle again there have been other ideas about uh, cross talk between um, two abnormal nerves by so-called AFAPs. And another thing that should not be mixed up with A waves is the situation where we have a uh, neuropathy and we have a distinct slowing of the most distal uh, parts of the nerve tree. So we have many slow components and when we stimulate here we get a dispersed uh, signal uh, that I will uh, show. Here are A waves in the tibial nerve and you see it's a lot of them, one here, one here, one here. Uh, when we superimpose we see these and we also see that it was one here, it was one here and so on. Uh, here is another where we see uh, one A wave between the C map and F response, and here is another that comes just uh, at the end of the F responses. How is it possible that the A waves can occur so late? Well, simply uh, if they are generated in an abnormal nerve with a slow conduction then it's very easy to understand that they can have uh, any latency. How can we differentiate between the real uh, A waves generated in this way and the uh, late components that occur here? Well, one simple way is to move the stimulus three centimeters more proximally. When you have an A wave and you move proximally, with the stimulator, the CMAP comes a little later and the A wave comes a little earlier, so they go together. If we have the same thing here, we stimulate and then more proximally, then the CMAP and the late components follow each other, they move together. I will show a few examples. Here you have uh, the uh, CMAP and here's the takeoff and then we move the stimulus uh, 20 millimeters and then the latency is longer here but for the A wave that is now all of a sudden shorter here's takeoff, here's takeoff here's an other situation where we have the late component here it really looks like an A wave and we do the same trick, we move the stimulator in proximal direction so that the C map comes a little later. But here you see that also this late component comes a little later. So in contrast to my previous slide, this is uh, now a, a C map satellite. It is really not an A wave, but, but it comes from the slow conducting. Uh, uh, very distal uh, nerve twigs. Here is another uh, situation where you have a patient with CIDP and you see a fantastic amount of uh, stable components. When we superimpose we see the stable components here and the unstable F responses out here. So what are these? Are these multiple A waves or is it something else? Well, by moving the stimulator from here, uh, which is at the ankle, with a lot of late components here, to the uh, to the knee, we see that the whole thing has changed together. The C map and all these uh, 
other late components. So these are not A waves, but these are um, C map uh, satellites. Then we can go over to the H reflex. That is a reflex, and the other two that I've talked about, F response and A waves, are not uh, reflexes. And the H reflex is studying both the sensory and motor axon uh, conduction and the motor neuron excitability. In the F wave, we, we measure the motor axon, and uh, the A wave is also signed from the motor axon. Here for the H reflex, we measure latency and amplitude in relation to the CMAP amplitude. And here is the mechanism for the H reflex, where we stimulate the nerve here with a very slight uh, stimulus. And that impulse goes both in uh, a distal direction and in proximal direction. In the retrograde way with the sensory nerve, it is then jumping over to the motor neuron and that provides a, re a motor response. And by stimulating very carefully, we are able to stimulate just the sensory, and therefore we just get this response. We increase the stimulus a little, we see it higher amplitude. And then when we increase the stimulus even more, then we st also start to stimulate the motor nerves in both directions. And this motor nerve that is goes in in the the antidromic direction will meet the signal that started here and came out as a motor. It will be a collision right here. So with increasing stimulus you start to see M wave and this one will be collided and disappear. And finally we only have the F responses. When it's the F then we stimulate motor and get the response from the motor. So it's a motor motor. This is a sensory motor. The H reflexes can be done uh, mainly for a few uh, levels of the spinal cord, uh, both in S1 and in uh, C6, C7. Here is H uh, reflex in tibial nerve slight stimulation we start to see the response here here are the late responses and then we increase the stimulus strength so that the CMAP increases and you can see how this uh, disappears more and more and here is uh, for the arm to flexor carpi radialis the same phenomenon the, these are a little more difficult to see and we don't see them in 100% like we do in the leg so therefore it's little more questionable uh, how to interpret the absence of an uh, H reflex in the arm. Here is another, uh, the, the same patient, the other uh, side. Here is just one case I wanted to show where we uh, make the nerve conduction in a patient with a myelopathy and a neuropathy he had this very low and abnormal uh, motor response and with the same gain we saw the late components that were higher in amplitude than the CMAP and that is not uh, possible that this is uh, an F response it must be something else and uh, when we stimulate uh, with a little stronger we get the little higher amplitude here and the late response disappeared. This is what it looks like when we repeat this, the uh, stimulations and you see that the pretty constant shape of this phenomenon. And here is when in this patient I reduced the stimulus strength and the CMAP disappeared and we still had the late responses. So this is uh, a H reflex in this uh, Mus muscle that was spastic. The protocol is that we stimulate the tibial nerve uh, with low stimulus strength, a long duration uh, to 
uh, favor the sensory nerves and to make a very low frequency because we have something called habituation where reflexes disappear. That is not true for F response but for H reflex. We record over soleus or gastroc and is useful for F1 radiculopathy and also polyneuropathy, myelopathy. And the reference values you can either use published values that are related to height and age, but in unilateral cases, in unilateral S1 radiculopathy, you can use the side asymmetry to guide. The asymmetry should be less than two milliseconds if you use exactly identical electrode positions. This is for the arm, median nerve, flexocarpal radialis, and otherwise the same thing. We also have one more thing regarding reflexes, and that is in some laboratories they uh, use uh, so-called T waves. That is the patellar reflex that you simply not only look at, but you record the response from the quadriceps femoris. And here is uh, at rest where you get the small response and with slight activation you get the facilitation and much higher amplitude and little shorter latency. Uh, this can be done in any muscle where you do your um, studies with the reflex uh, uh, hammer. Here are some summary of the of the A wave F way repeaters and H reflex. The CMAP sa satellite is late components that follow the CMAP when we change cathode position. Uh, so that is a part of a neuropathy. A waves, they are generated anywhere along the peripheral nerve indicating a local axonal hyper excitability and has nothing to do with the motor neuron. It starts in the axon and varies in latency. F waves come from the motor neuron. For each neuron, they do not occur so often, probably less than 5% as we have measured. Repeaters, that are repeater F waves, so they come from the motor neuron and they come two or three up to seven times per 20 stimuli. The latency is naturally the same as the latency. A waves come more than seven times per 20, usually up to 100%. And H reflex that we uh, look at when we have spasticity or um, approximal sensory involvement same latency as F waves, constant shape, and we see them with low stimulation when they have low CMAP amplitude. When we increase the stimulus, uh, then they disappear, and it must be a slow stimulation rate. So the difference again between them, A waves is from the peripheral nerve, probably ion channel trouble, F wave, motor neuron, and looks at motor neuron excitability, and H reflex takes care of both the sensory and motor axon conduction and the excitability of the motor neuron uh, in, uh, for example, central disorders, but also useful in uh, some radiculopathies. So that was uh, the all for today. Thank you very much.